Hi, everyone. This is Ruthie Gotenberg from the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you for joining us for our the next uh, webinar in our series of um, PRI and MRI Community of Learning webinar series. Uh, we're very excited about today's webinar. We have um, a wonderful presenter that I've just been chatting with, Amy Jensen from the Northwest Area Foundation. This is on bridging the gap between the investment office and the program office. It's an area that several funders in it who work in the PRI field have um, discussed discuss with us that they, it's been a challenge getting the investment office to come on board with uh, trying PRIs and MRIs and different products like this. So I'm just going to again just ask everyone if you're not speaking to mute your line with your mute button or star 6 to mute and star 7 to unmute. I'm going to Amy get started. If you're at the computer and you have questions, please put them in the chat window so Amy can watch them as they come in. If you are not on the computer and you have a question, so uh, Amy, every few slides maybe just stop for a moment and see if there are questions and people you can, you can just speak up and ask your question. So Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you to start the presentation and tell us a little bit about your work at the Northwest Area Foundation. Thank you, and thank you everyone um, for calling in today. At any point that you have questions, now, please feel free to either um, enter it in the chat window or interrupt me. I, I would love to talk about questions as you have them and, and really um, make this very, we're a small group so it can be, I think, really interactive. Um, as mentioned, I am the Investment Director for the Northwest Area Foundation. The Northwest Area Foundation is a private foundation. We were funded in 1934. We were funded by Louis Hill, who's the son of James J. Hill, who founded the Great Northern Railroad. And today the foundation still operates in the eight states where the Great Northern Railroad ran. If you think of a map of the United States and go Iowa and Minnesota and then go west to the coast, that's the area where we um, work. We try and pursue a mission where we reduce poverty and strengthen financial capability for people in our region. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to provide that context to you because I think that it's really important as you think about how you implement impact investing, MRIs, PRIs, to think about the mission and how that can be connected to the larger part of your portfolio. The foundation has about $440 million in assets today and a staff of uh, roughly 25, but I am the only dedicated investment professional. Um, so in, in trying to bridge the gap, in some ways it's a little bit easier when you have a smaller investment staff um, because you're not trying to incorporate you know, 10 people into the program team. Um, it's really me who's the most important part of, the, of, of working with programs on, on the mission-related investments. I think it's interesting, uh, connecting program staff with investment staff is something that, that sort of has been talked about. It's certainly been talked about everywhere I've ever worked. And I think most organizations have this discussion. It's, it's been discussed for many years. And it's a problem that's never really been resolved. I don't know of anyone who thinks they really have conquered this and really have a, a, a great integrated organization. I think one of the reasons why it has come to the forefront again recently is the increased attention on you know, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG investing, socially responsible investing, mission-related investing, and impact-related investing. As those things have all become sort of more widely accepted and more and more organizations are pursuing them, the fact that you have maybe a program staff and investment staff who don't work together has become, um, it's highlighted and it's sort of a more serious problem. So I think well, in the past, there were organizations that said, it's okay if they don't work together. We need this group to make, you know, maximize return, and we need this group to make the grants. Now everyone is really trying to get them integrated toward, uh, toward the larger mission goal. Um, so I, I think, you know, this is a pretty serious challenge. Um, and I wanted to talk about, I wanted to tell you a story um, from a, another organization that I've worked at that sort of highlights this. Uh, I worked in an organization that was attempting to, to really build out its infrastructure, and we were um, adding new software, contact management software, document retention software, all, the, all these different systems. And our director, our IT director, was setting up training sessions. And I think he did what most um, IT directors do, and they have, you know, they sort of block three or four times, and they say, everyone just sign up for one that works for you, come, and we'll go through the training. 
and he was incredibly frustrated at how badly these training sessions were going. Um, we didn't really get much done. Some people had questions they wanted to spend a lot of time on. Other people wanted to move faster. And, and he couldn't really figure out what he was doing wrong. And one of our staff members who has spent his entire career in nonprofits said, I can't believe that you think you can do a training session that has program staff and accountants and lawyers in one room and that you're ever going to, to, to have them be happy with the training. That, you're, that's never going to work. And he, he sort of still didn't get it. He was like, I don't know, you know, why shouldn't teaching people one way work for both these groups? And so they did a little experiment, and, and I was part of that experiment. And they sent an email, and they said, we'd like everyone, or we'd like, it was really two of us, we'd like you to tell us how you get to work in the morning. And so my answer to that question was, I turn right on Edgewater Boulevard, I turn right on Cedar, then I get on 62 West, I drive six miles. So I had this very linear, direct, straightforward, this is how I drive to work in the morning. And the other person they asked, a good friend of mine named Erin Coriel, they said, how do you get to work in the morning, Erin? And she's a program officer. And she had this very long answer that had all this context around it. You know, and, and it was, on mornings when my husband teaches, he'll have made coffee, but if he doesn't teach, then I'll make the coffee, and I have to feed the cat and get the paper. And she provided all this other information. And then the last line was, and then I drive to work. And that was this great learning experience for our IT director because it sort of said to him, we are not thinking about things the same way. We don't work in the same way. And so what's really important about this is if we think differently and we use different vocabulary and we go about our jobs differently and we evaluate success differently and we, and we talk differently, we're not going to just naturally work together. That won't be something that's going to happen accidentally. If you want your program staff to work really closely with your investment staff, your accounting team, we have to acknowledge that we are very different, and we have to intentionally find ways for people to work together successfully. And that can't just happen on its own. We have to do it very intentionally, very thoughtfully, and seek out opportunities to get these groups working together, to have them work on projects together, to see how they can help each other. Um, and so I think the, the most important thing is to not just think there's going to be some happy accident where this occurs, but to be really focused on it and intentional and always looking for opportunities to, to advance this. So I think one of the things, and not everyone is going to have this opportunity, I understand that. Sometimes you already have an existing um, investment staff, so there's nothing you can do. But at times, there will be turnover. People will leave and you will have openings. And at that point, I think it's, in, it's critically important that you are intentional in your hiring practices. I don't think many organizations are intentional in making sure that when they seek investment professionals or even finance professionals in other roles, that they have the same sort of commitment to mission that you're going to find, all, I mean, always, always on the program side of the house. So I think about looking at people's backgrounds. Are they coming from an investment manager? Are they coming from a corporate background? Are they coming even, you know, even from a state pension? That's very different than if you have previously worked at a, at a nonprofit, if you've previously worked at a foundation. It's a very different culture. And so I think it's really important to, to, to look for people who have demonstrated that that's the culture that they're interested in. I know other investment professionals who have had a very hard time transitioning from a very corporate structure to a nonprofit or to a foundation where we aren't, you know, we don't have the same sort of organizational structure. It's not as hierarchical. It's it's much less structured. I think it's um, I think it's much more creative, and that's not for everyone. So I think it's really important in the hiring process to to really look at people's backgrounds and if they're making a big change to really be clear about the type of culture that you have and the type of person that you're looking for. Um, the second thing is really the motivation. Why, why would someone want to come work for your foundation? What is their interest? Are they just, you know, I think that there is a perception sometimes among investment professionals that foundations, endowments um, pay better, 
They are um, opportunities to do a little bit more creative work than you might have in, in say, a corporate pension where people are looking at your returns every quarter. So, you know, look at their background. Think about their motivation for their new job. It's very easy for people to say, oh, no, I think you have a great mission. That's fantastic. It's different if you look for a demonstrated passion around the mission. Have they ever, do they have volunteer experience? Are they on the boards of other nonprofits? Are they involved in other organizations in the community or, or in the area where you do your work? Is there, is there anything that they can really demonstrate a, a passion around the mission outside of just saying, no, I think you have a great mission? I, and I think being really intentional from the beginning and saying to prospective employees, prospective investment staff, finance staff, we will expect you to collaborate with the program staff. We expect you to do mission-related investing. We have an emphasis on ESG investing. We would like to make sure that all of our investments are really aligned with our values. Being upfront about that is incredibly important, and I think that, that the more direct we are in communicating that to potential employees, the, better, the higher the likelihood that we're going to have a good fit. Um, because I have seen sometimes where, where people just don't really fit within an organization, and that's incredibly important. It's hard to change a person who is not really interested in, in what the organization is doing. The second thing that I think is, is often set up as misalignment is compensation. Very often foundations um, will have some sort of financial incentive or, or bonus that they pay investment staff. The problem with that is it's usually structured around outperformance of a financial benchmark. And so when you go to a staff that receives part of their compensation purely based on performance and say, from now on, we'd also like you to look at things that have a social impact, have a, have a double bottom line, their first response is likely to be, how does this impact my financial bonus? How does this impact my compensation? And I, I think it's really important that you create incentives that align this person with the organization's objectives. And if you still want to provide some sort of compensation bonus, I will tell you, I don't, I don't have a bonus. I think that's the best structure. But if that's something that you need to do to attract people or retain people, try and make sure that that aligns with the organization's objectives. So maybe instead of having it be purely a quantitative um, benchmark-based decision on what the bonus will be. Part of the bonus is on um, working with others in the organization. Part of it is on um, implementing a, an ESG policy. So just try and make it qualitative in a way that then you can really align the incentives to, to, for the investment staff to be more integrated into the organization. I think one of the reasons that at the Northwest Area Foundation, I feel like I am more integrated into the program side of the house than I have been at any other organization, is that we had some opportunities very early on for me to work closely with the program staff, and those are invaluable. If you can, you know, sometimes you have sort of a happy accident, and in some ways that's what happened when I joined the foundation in 2013. Um, the foundation had just embarked on a review of the mission-related investing strategy. The foundation had been doing mission-related investing since 2004, and we were just coming up on, on this point where the board said, we need to think about what we're going to do in the future. You know, here's what we have done. Let's assess that. Let's look at how successful it was and decide if we're going to do that again. Are we going to maybe do an increased amount? How are we going to focus our dollars in this way? And that was just when I started at the foundation. And so it provided this great opportunity for me to work really closely with Carla Miller, who's our program director, and one of our um, program officers, Justin Heineman, on this subcommittee, essentially. And we ended up writing a really detailed paper and recommendation on how we thought we could implement this at the foundation. And I think that opportunity to have really close early collaboration helped me develop really good relationships uh, with the program staff here. And that, um, you know, that's invaluable. And, and, and we still work together. This was approved then by our board in, in February of 2014. And we have continued to work really closely together on the implementation of both the mission-related 
and, and the program-related aspects of our strategy. So we've had an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, at other organizations I've been at, those opportunities haven't always occurred. And, and I think that that's, you know, part of it is where is an opportunity where we can have these groups really collaborate on something and work on it together and, and build these relationships. Um, I also would, would just say we, my president, Kevin Walker, has really done a great job of finding other opportunities. So obviously we finished up the mission-related investing strategy. Um, and then this year, one of the things the program officers undertook was a, a really deep strategic learning and evaluation review. And I was invited to be part of that as well. It was another great opportunity for me to work with them. And we also spent a lot of time thinking about for the mission-related investments and program-related investments, how are we going to do the evaluation? And, and how frequently are we going to do it? And what are the big questions we're going to answer? So again, just finding opportunities where either group is working on something and saying, how can we get someone from the other team into this project and just have people working together? If you don't have large sort of organization-wide projects, like those prior um, ones that I highlighted that I got to participate in here, you know, just think about other ways internally that you can have people work together. I, mean, I think of, you know, we have a wellness committee which plans different events. Um, a, a group that works on a um, staff grant making that we get to do, just ways for people to work cross-functionally. It's really important to find those or create them if they don't exist, just to have people work with others that they normally wouldn't see in, in sort of you know their day-to-day -day job. So I think that finding those opportunities for collaboration and promoting that really important. I also think you know, program staff can do a lot to help the investment staff. One of the things that's made my transition to the Northwest Area Foundation so easy and, and has made it um, really exciting and fun to find mission-related investing opportunities is that I have a really good understanding of, uh, of the strategy that the program officers are, are pursuing and the theory of change. And, and they communicate that incredibly well to the, you know, to the board, as I think in, in most organizations. But our program officers also write these really great papers. And those papers have been really helpful for me because not only can I read them and have a really in-depth understanding of what they're doing, but they're sort of a good reference point for me. Every time I look at a mission-related investment, I sort of think about where would this fit? Where would these organizations fit in, in our portfolios of grants? And how do they complement some of the grant making? I've had a, a really great um, relationship with our program director, Carla Miller. Carla also looks at MRIs with me, and, and as I go through sort of my theory of how this fits with the impact, she will always review that with me and say, no, I don't think that's a great fit, or sometimes I'm surprised by investments I show her that she's really excited about, um, because maybe they're working on something that I, that I don't even know about yet, but this would be a really good complement to that. And, and, and so I think it's just really important to have, to have this good understanding of the strategy, of the program staff theory of change, of the investment thesis for the mission-related investments, and just communicate that to each other. It's always a really good, um, it's a really good use of staff time to collaborate on, on these if we're going to try and make the larger portfolio be more in line with the mission of the foundation. I have, uh, investment, uh, the inv I have participated in meetings with grantees, which has been amazing. And one of the, I think I had only been here about six months when I got to go on my first site visit, um, which was local. And it was, it, it just meant a tremendous amount to me. It's completely different to see the dollars really on the ground as opposed to just, you know, maybe reading a list of grants that were approved in the third quarter. For example, I, I really took away a lot of knowledge from the site visit about um, some of our economic development strategies. And I think that that has also helped me narrow the field of potential mission-related investments to things that are really a good, a good match. So anytime you can have investment staff participate in meetings with grantees or go on site visits, I, I think that learning is really, really important. And then finally on the program side, sort of sharing results of learning and evaluation. We have, um, at the foundation, we've really had a focus on learning and evaluation and, and really assessing 
you know, both our PRI strategy from 2004 and also our mission-related investing strategy from 2004. We actually released a case study through Mission Investors Exchange on our uh, initial mission-related investments. And, and I think sharing the learning and evaluation is really important because there are things that we have tried that, that um, have not, were not a total success, but we learned a lot from them. And, and we talk a lot about the learning. There's sort of, you know, there's the financial return, there's the social return, but there's also a learning value. And so, you know, just really understanding things that we've tried that maybe didn't work out the way we planned, but we learned some important lessons from that with each other and talking through some of those things can be helpful to make sure that, that we can really refine the strategy going forward. So I think that sharing and discussion is really valuable and, and often doesn't occur to the degree that it should. On the investment side, the investment staff, it's, a lot of it is, is really very similar to what I think, what I said the you know, program staff could do to help the investment staff, and that is um, I like to really incorporate program staff into the due diligence process. So I, I've had program officers meet with prospective managers both before we've made a decision and then after, we are working directly with two of our mission-related investing managers on impact assessment. And, and in some cases, it's new for them. Uh, we have one manager who, who has just been sort of measuring economic activity, and we'd like to go a little bit deeper than that and, and think about um, how many jobs have been created and the quality of those jobs. So part of it is, is that type of collaboration. But another Im important part, we, in talking to another one of our managers, they were talking about how they'd like their portfolio companies to offer um, particular types of benefits to their employees. And it was helpful, one of the programs offers was like, we actually have an organization that can probably help you with that sort of financial education that you want them to provide, uh, maybe some um, individual savings accounts. So just the knowledge that the program officers have can be incredibly helpful to investment managers as they're thinking about how to refine their own impact strategy or how to measure impact. So we've had really great productive meetings, and I think that um, you know, that is going to make it that much easier sort of five years down the road when we're looking at both our mission-related investments and our program-related investments and our ability to sort of compare those and, and think about the same impacts um, done through different types of investing. Um, so having them participate in the due diligence process, meet with managers, and also sharing the learning and evaluation. We learned a lot from our first mission-related investment um, in regard to sort of what, I'll, what I'm going to call intentionality. I think that we believed that by putting capital to work in our region, it would, it would just create jobs. And while it did create a lot of jobs, it didn't actually generate a financial return. And, and so now we think about if we're giving an investment manager money, what exactly is their strategy to create jobs? I don't want it to just be um, sort of an outcome that occurs. I want it to be an intentional impact that they seek. And so that sort of, it's a different level of, of commitment by the managers and a different level of due diligence on the strategies and, and sort of the theory of change. But all of those things are things that, that I've communicated with the program officers and that we've talked about, and I think it helps us all think about our jobs a little bit differently. So again, just, just really, I think, constant sharing of information is really important. The next thing I think, and maybe this is the one that's most, um, most relevant to the group, what can leadership do? I think it's important that leadership have a clear expectation of collaboration between the two groups and that that be communicated to all of them, that there is an expectation that we will work together on these things, that, that it isn't just the program staff doing a program-related investment and the investment staff doing mission-related or market rate of return investments, that we want all of these investments and grants to work together and, and really all move forward um, toward our mission goals. But that has to be clear. And, and I think that too often it's just a, this should happen and people should work together. That expectation needs to be set up very, very much from the, at, the, at the very top of the organization. 
I think it's critical to facilitate opportunities for partnering, however that can be done. If it can be done um, as it was here where I got to work on the mission-related investing strategy, maybe it's about um, organizational level goals, just find ways and opportunities for people to work together with groups that they wouldn't normally work together. I think it's important to build in time for partnering. Everybody is busy. We're all very busy. You know, nobody works at a foundation because they um, <laughs> dislike hard work. I think you know, the program staff here is going all of the time. So it's really important for leadership to say it's, it's important for us to partner, and we have to find time to do that and, and build it into the work that we do. Um, I think it's important that it's valued and appreciated. Staff is unlikely to make changes to their normal way of operating unless that change is, is valued and appreciated by leadership. So it's important that whoever is sort of managing the investment staff, if that falls under um, a CIO or a CFO, that they're really valuing hard work toward trying to find investments that are aligned with the larger organization's mission. And I think it's important to lead by example. If, if leadership is only interested in parts of the organization, so, so if there is an organizational structure where you say, okay, the CFO is, is in charge of all of the things finance related and the chief program officer is in charge of all the program related things, that sort of reinforces that you have two parts of one organization and they are separate from each other. So I think it's important for you know, if you, if you have that sort of a structure, those two people need to work together. If you have um, a little bit looser structure, just make sure that everyone um, really is working for the goals of the entire organization rather than being focused on just one small area. I think it does everyone a disservice if we think of two halves of the organization working independently of each other. They really, everyone can work toward the mission. It may take a little more effort for leadership to structure that, but it is absolutely doable. And I think it's, it's when it's done well, it really is beneficial for everyone. So that is sort of the prepared remarks. Um, I've not seen any chat questions come in, but I would just sort of open it up now for people who um, maybe have any questions about how we've done the mission-related investment strategy or, or how we've managed to sort of build what I think is a great team here. Hi, this is Elizabeth Costin from UJA Federation. Um, thank you for, for your presentation. Um, so my question is related to, so I, I think what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense for a foundation or an organization that is already sort of bought into the idea that mission-related investment is good. Um, for those of us who work at organizations that are very large and move very slowly and are really sort of stuck on the research around the impact of mission-related investments and that there's a real culture change that, that is needed in order to um, make the case that this is something that we should really be doing, although individuals may, may agree with it, the leadership and those who are uh, responsible for the, in, the organizational investments may not be. Um, what would your recommendation be, or thoughts in terms of, of how to make that case? And also, is there any research in the field that you think can, um, can help to make that case? And that's, that's a, you make a valid point that we, I was fortunate to be at an organization where, um, where the mission-related investing, well, there was just big buy-in. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have some holdouts. So there were certainly skeptics. You know, I, we have a board of directors. There were certainly skeptics on the board of directors, um, at least one member of the investment committee. So when we did this strategy refresh, we, we really started sort of at the beginning. And we said, okay, let's go back to what we did in 2004 and look at, uh, we did, at that point we did $10 million of PRIs and we did one $10 million mission-related investment. And we, and we looked at where we were successful and where we weren't. Um, I will tell you on our mission-related investment, we had great impact in terms of the number of jobs that we created, but we had very low financial returns. 
so we looked at what do we think, you know, what drove that um, outcome, how can we do that differently in the future. So we started of a play, at a place where it was really reflection on what we had done, what had worked and hadn't. And then we brought in, to meet with this subcommittee that was considering the new strategy, um, other organizations who had done this. So we talked to um, F.B. Heron, Meyer Memorial Trust, so a number of organizations who had already done more mission-related investing than we had. And I think that was a really great opportunity that that committee, that mattered a great deal to them to see that really in practice and in action, I guess is how I would say it. Um, and another way that we sort of moved people along to, to adopting this strategy was I think sometimes it's very difficult in the abstract to think about mission-related investing. And, and there's this, you know, a, from, it, from an investment professional standpoint, it's always, well, I have to get something up to get that. And one of the things that made it, I think, easier for them all to vote for the, for the adoption um, was really providing concrete examples. So this is what a mission-related investment might look like. And we provided, um, on the program side, we provided a number of potential PRIs that we could do. And we also provided a number of market rate investments. And I think sometimes, you know, and I don't mean to knock, you know, I'm obviously um, the investment director. I don't think investment people are as creative as program staff ever. I, um, it's just not the way our minds tend to work. And so there's something about finding these things and seeing the structure it's much easier to see in the concrete than in the abstract. So having a couple of examples where, okay, here's a private equity type structured fund, and they make investments in small companies in rural areas, which um, otherwise have difficulty accessing capital. Just seeing those things in the concrete help people understand how they could still have a, an attractive financial return, and it could still be aligned with our mission. Um, and so I think that that's really compelling. And so part of it may be if you have an investment staff or leadership that isn't bought in yet that this can be done, is maybe, you know, maybe the program staff, maybe somebody else has to surface some of these examples and say, let's meet with them. We're considering them as either a PRI or an MRI, but let's meet with them and just talk about the strategy. Or here's a strategy that, w that I think is really interesting can, can we talk about this together? Because I'm sure you'll think of things that I won't think of. So I think uh, concrete examples are an incredibly good way to sort of start that dialogue and discussion. There are organizations who have done, you know, mission-related investing successfully. So it's not, we aren't really at the very beginning of this. I think Mission Investors Exchange is a great resource for um, examples of successful investments, for um, white papers and case studies on on impact investing, so um, I think those are all things that can can really sort of help bring along members of the board or leadership who aren't fully committed yet. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Amy, can I ask a question? Of course. I, if, could you talk about examples of maybe that you know of or examples how maybe a, a small family foundation can actually start walking down this path and, and how they, maybe how they could go about it? Okay. So I think obviously for a small organization, it's always a challenge of resources. Um, and, and oftentimes you might have a staff that says, we'd really like to do PRIs or MRIs, but we don't have any experience doing that. And so you know, how do we get started? Um, and I think one of the really great ways to get started is to partner with someone else. So we have a great community. I'm located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we have a really great community of foundations um, throughout the state, actually. And we work together really closely on, on um, PRIs and MRIs. So we have a very good sense of, of our missions, and, and obviously all of our missions are not the same, right? So I, I work with an organization that is only in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So they don't have as, as large of a geography as I do. 
Um, and, and the Minneapolis Foundation, which is a community foundation, has an even smaller sort of footprint that they operate in. But we all know each other. We connect through our um, Minnesota Council Foundations group in particular. We talk about what we're working on, what we're doing. This is an investment that I'm thinking of making. Um, I've done due diligence with a, with a smaller community foundation, and we've shared all of that work together. Um, so I think that sort of a partnership with maybe somebody who has a little bit more experience, and, and, and maybe that person is, maybe that organization, I guess I should say, is local and you know them, or maybe it's an organization that you know because their mission aligns with yours. They have some of the same programmatic objectives that you do. I think that is a great way to do this. And I know some larger foundations that are trying to, you know, partner with smaller foundations and say, okay, we'll structure a PRI. We have experience with that. Um, we have a standard set of legal documents, so we'll use our legal documents. We'll let you participate in the meeting so you can see the questions that we're asking and also thinking about um, how we're going to evaluate this. And you'll just sort of put in, maybe early on, you'll just put in capital and you'll just sort of be, al be along for um, uh, the ride on this. And then as you learn, maybe you'll do some more with us, or maybe you'll develop some of your own PRIs. But I think that's an incredibly way, and I think most organizations are really eager to do it. Um, you know, the complication is sometimes even foundations that have similar missions um, have difficulty working together, but I think we just have to make a real effort to do that. That's, that's the only way that we will sort of, you know, gain that momentum where we have more people doing PRIs and MRIs and then the response from investment managers, um, you know, will be even greater because they'll know there's more capital trying to find these opportunities. So I think, I think partnering with someone with more experience, um, and maybe you know, maybe maybe that comes with a larger staff and more resources, is a really great way to sort of do your first foray into program-related investments or mission-related investments. Thank you. That was, that was very helpful. And we have a question in the chat window. Can you share your PRI legal document? I think I can. Um, I know we're just oh. going through. We're just doing a new review of ours, but I, I think I absolutely can do that. And I think uh, I think there are also some on Mission Investors Exchange. I don't know if you've checked there, but um, if you, so I just have initials yeah, there. I think so. Maybe uh, maybe you can help connect me with whoever is asking for the for the document. Yeah, terrific. I can, if you send it to me, I can forward it to um, to forward the people on this call. I'm putting a, a great place to look for documents. Everyone is uh, missioninvestors.org. They share. I'm going to put it in the chat window. There are a lot of documents there that you can download that other foundations have shared. Um, it's a great place to look for them. But Amy, I also I'll forward them if you could forward that to me. Are there any other questions? Does anyone want to share any of their experience? Starting this? So I'm going to take that as just checking if anyone who's muted is trying to speak. So I'm going to, if anyone has any more questions, you're welcome to speak up now, or you can email me questions and I can forward them to Amy. Um, Amy, I wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us and present and share your information. We're going to keep this as a re this recording as a resource on our website, which I think will be very helpful um, for as more and more foundations start going down this path. I wanted to also invite everyone to join us. There'll be a meeting on PRIs in New York on December 3rd, a breakfast meeting from 8 to 9:30. So you can register on the website for that. At our next webinar, which was in originally scheduled for November 30th has been postponed. The new date is should be forthcoming about small foundations using PRIs. And again, oh, we have someone who would like to share a few thoughts. So we have someone, Jeff, if you want to speak up, we'd love to hear your experience. The line might be muted though. Try star 7 to unmute. I think there's someone who's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute you, Jeff. Here we go. Okay. I've Hello? unmuted you. Am there I you go. Okay. 
Yeah, I think there's a huge difference, though, between uh, mission-related investments and PRIs uh, that, you know, just really makes a, a difference. I, I, I take on the philanthropic role and the investing role, and um, not really that interested in the mission-related investments because, uh, I mean, you, I share the thought from the investment side that, uh, you know, the, you want to maximize your return so you can do other philanthropic projects. So, uh, I mean, it's not because it, it's a feel-good investment. But from the, the PRI standpoint, there's a lot of advantage. You know, it's very advantageous because it's going against your distribution. Uh, so, therefore, you can take on, uh, you know, much riskier investing uh, opportunity. And because it, 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 if it fails, it's going against your uh, dis charitable distribution. And I, I don't know if that point was all that made that clear, but I think there's just a, it makes a big difference in terms of the outlook. And uh, so uh, the, the PRI is almost is coming from, uh, in a lot of ways, the grant making uh, side of the equation more so than the investing. And uh, uh, it gives you a lot of opportunities just to take on risk. And I and I've and I've participated in a couple of the, the PRIs, and I look at it as uh, uh, from that standpoint rather than the investing standpoint. And so I, I don't know if that oh, delineation was, you know, uh, I'm sorry. We just uh, so I will tell you that at the Northwest Area Foundation, we don't really think of PRIs in that way. So I'll just tell you that we our PRIs that we do are on top of our five percent. So we're not trying to uh, – we're very intentional that we weren't trying to, to reduce the amount of grant making that we were doing. So we still do 5% grant making. We have a pool of PRI dollars that is recycled. Um, and then our market, relate, market rate, mission-related investments are um, an additional pool to that. So, so on the PRI side, we don't count those towards our 5% distribution. Right, but they can be counted, so it gives you a, it gives you quite a, uh, you know, an advantageous situation to be making more, uh, you know, to be making those type of investments. And therefore, uh, if you if you look at it in that context, it, you know, then, you know, well, you might not be doing that, but from what I understand, in terms of our guidance, we we they can go against your distribution. So therefore, if if, if the PRI doesn't work out, hey, you know, it's it's just. You have that kind of opportunity, you know, that flexibility to take on a higher risk investment. Uh, so uh, that you know, that's what makes it very attractive uh, from that standpoint. At least that that's how I've looked at it. And I think uh, you know, I think many people do count that toward their five percent distribution. But our intention was was to not lower the grant making. So it's it was really to be, you know. We have to distribute 5% as a private foundation, but how can we then use the other capital that we have, the other 95%, and try and have greater impact with that? And so that's why we created the revolving pool of PRI dollars, as well as saying we're going to earmark 10% of the assets within the, within the foundation's portfolio to also have a mission-aligned impact. And I would say that we don't think that our – Impact, our mission-related investments have a lower rate of return. We think that they have a market rate of return and they have a social impact. So, so for example, we do mezzanine debt investing, which is very common, I think, among institutional investors. But our mezzanine debt investments happen to be targeted to low to moderate income zones or companies who, who their employees reside in low to moderate income zones. So we receive the rate of return of, of you know, a, a mezzanine debt type of investment, but on top of that, we create jobs and and um, and we measure whether or not those jobs are high quality. So I don't, we don't think that we're giving up return in order to have that impact. It's just being more targeted in how we make those investments. Yeah, no, I did, there's definitely those internals in terms of all the different investments. It's just that a lot of people promote. You know, program-related and I mean, mission-related investments. Is this is something that is worthwhile because of the impact and maybe, you know, it's a, it's sort of the debate as far as the return. So that's just a, a question. But I, I do think just in terms of delineating between the idea of program-related investments and mission-related investments, there's quite a differentiation 
because you do have the capacity to go, have it go against the return. Uh, so it's just a thought, uh, which is which has been attractive from our standpoint to pursue per, to be involved in some of the PRI investments uh, in terms of high risk investments take on a much higher risk as far as some medical you know startups or startup companies uh, that we would there's no way we would be investing in on a you know, on a regular basis. Uh, so it's just a different way of looking at it, which can be very attractive for uh, for for taking on you know, uh, those type of investments, which you had, most people would in order most organizations would in order like be doing themselves. Um, and I think one of the things that we have sort of hoped to achieve, because we do have you know we have a relatively narrow mission related to um, reducing poverty, and and also because we operate in a specific geographic region. I think one of the things that we aspire to is to have um, situations where we will be investing all along the spectrum. So for example, we might make a grant to um, a CDFI to, um, to do research on the, maybe a, a specific type of loan, um, how many they would make, how many, how the dollars of each one of those loans, what the terms would be, and what, and then, you know, so we fund that sort of through a grant. We determine what the loss levels are, and then maybe the next step is a PRI where we provide that CDFI with additional capital for them to make loans. And then we hope, you know, that at some point that creates an opportunity for maybe a mission-related investment where perhaps we could do some type of equity investment in, in maybe businesses that were started um, through, through the loans by the CDFI. So, you know, that's another way that I think we think about integrating all parts of the dollars leaving, whether they're grants, whether they're PRIs, whether they're investments, just integrating all of those into the advancement of the mission. Right, and I mean, we just use a lot of we've invested in a lot of medical start a couple of medical startup companies, uh, made some grants for some general research, but also there's been some spinoffs for uh, you know Series A financing that you know we've been able to act as an angel investor, and ordinarily that's the kind of example where those are high risk investments. Uh, that we normally would not be making directly, but because they can go against the distribution. Hey, this is a worthwhile, you know, w w you know, it's, seeing it is is sort of capital that we can deploy where uh, the downside is it's ultimately going to go against the distribution. Uh, it, otherwise, it'd be too high of a risk to use for uh, you know regular investable assets, and that might be appealing to anybody who's ta you know involved in that kind of space far as that in terms of the startups, in terms of high-risk startups. So just thought I'd share that <laughs> in terms of uh, perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Jeff, thank you. Um, and Jeff, any last questions? Okay, so I'm, we're going to post this recording out probably in the next few days. Um, Amy, again, thank you so much for this very um, informed and very helpful webinar. I've already gotten notes from people who are participating on it, wanting the recording. And again, thank you for your time. And if you have any documents you want me to share with them, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.